Now, I wonder what you think when someone says, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? I don't know how you might answer that question. And boys and girls, I know that sometimes at school, your friends, maybe your teachers, they know you go to church and they say, well, why? What, what is a Christian? What does a Christian do? What does a Christian believe? And a lot of people over the years have had some very interesting answers to that question, ranging from the sublime to the ridiculous. What is a Christian and what do Christians believe? It's a good question. And people are still asking that question today. So this morning, I want to try and answer that question by looking at the lives of some very, very interesting people from history. Some of history's most incredible and, yes, horrible moments. So this morning, we are doing Pastor Rich's Horrible Histories. So indeed, it is horrible histories. I don't know about the talking rat thing, but there we go, if the hat fits. In particular, we're thinking about three men called Simeon. So it is the Super Simeons, three men from different periods of history. And these are all absolutely true stories. And only one of them isn't horrible. See if you can guess which one that is. And we're going to begin in Roman times. And the Romans are an interesting bunch, aren't they, boys and girls? I know that a lot of you uh, think about Romans at school. And, uh, you know, I'm interested in the Romans. And I'm often wondering what have they ever done for us and all that. Okay. (laughs) So we're going to begin our our journey of discovery uh, about what a Christian is in Roman times. At the beginning of the 4th century... And I'm going to introduce you to this man called Diocletian. I know he's not called Simeon, but we've got to start somewhere. He sets the scene for us. The Roman emperor. He looks a bit shifty, doesn't he? I think it's the eyes. Now, the most important thing that Emperor Diocletian did during his time was in 303, he made it legal to round up and kill Christians. That's pretty nasty, isn't it? He hated Christians because... He said that all people should worship him. He's the emperor, you worship me. And because the Christians refused to do that, he said, right, we're going to kill a lot of you. And so he legalized the killing of Christians. And he even said you could get a tax break. You could get paid to persecute. So before, it was only the army who could intervene if you refused to worship the emperor. But because he changed the law, now everybody could do it. Anyone could, could tell the authorities about you, round you up, they could present you dead to the police. Horrible, horrible man. Diocletian made persecution popular and profitable. But as a result of that, it was impossible to be half-hearted as a Christian. You couldn't be a nominal believer. Nobody in those days said, well, do you know what? I don't really know what I am, but if you're to ask me, I'll just write down Christian because I was born in Britain. Nobody did that. Nobody did that because the angry mobs would turn you into the army and you'd likely get killed for saying so. The only people who actually professed faith were those who really deeply knew and believed and treasured Christian truth. They were the real deal. There was no half-hearted person who was a Christian In those days, you wouldn't want to put your family in harm's way if it didn't mean anything to you. So, Diocletian helps us to think about Christianity as not just a label. It's not just something you are because you're born in Britain or because mum and dad is a Christian. A Christian is someone who really takes very seriously what they believe. So guys, do you know what you believe? Do you take it seriously? Does it change your life would you risk life and limb for Jesus well two years after Diocletian legalized the killing of Christians he retired from his job as emperor and he did what most people would do if they were that way inclined was he retired to grow cabbages that's true that's exactly what he did 
He went to a cabbage farm in the Balkans. Uh, And after this, there was a little bit of a change in the way that the Roman leadership structure worked. And our story now takes us, on the next slide, to the centre of the universe, to uh, Yorkshire. (laughs) Yes, and this man, uh, Constantine, is repelling hordes of angry barbarians called Scotland. Uh, And news comes into Constantine and the army that Constantine's father has died. So Constantine is now proclaimed Caesar right there in York, right by the Minster, exactly that spot. And you can go there today, it's true. So emboldened by his newfound power, Constantine does what he thinks is the next logical thing to do, and that's to go to France and have a war, which is what he does. But when he's in France, he has a religious experience. Many people think he actually converted to Christianity in AD 312. So think about it, right? Big news. If you're a Christian, now Caesar is saying he's a Christian. So this persecution thing is going to get a little bit awkward, isn't it? So he changed the law again in 313 and basically said you can't kill Christians anymore. That's fine. In fact, far from it now being a situation of persecution, Caesar was uh, Constantine was appointing bishops to the best jobs in the Roman office. So actually, Christians were now getting the best jobs. So when the general population realized, as they did, that because of Caesar's new law, because Christians are getting good jobs, actually now, identifying as a Christian was actually a financially good thing to do. You could be making money from being a Christian. You wouldn't get persecuted anymore. So instead of making money by turning the Christians in, they would say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian for sure. Now can I have a nice job? And so there was a huge rise in nominalism. A huge rise. Because it was very easy now to be a Christian. It was safe. It was fashionable. And you didn't need any kind of commitment anymore. But that safe, fashionable half-hearted Christianity, cultural Christianity, appalled the generation of people who really did suffer and die under Diocletian's persecution. They bled and died for what they believed, and now people were faking it just to get a job. So those who were genuinely Christians had to think out a new way of, of taking their faith seriously and living it out in a public way that people would notice that they're not like the other guys. They're not these half-hearted ones. They thought, well, we need to reject that, that wishy-washy, half-hearted thing. We need to stand out and separate from the mainstream Christianity. And so began the monastic movement, monks. And they said, we need to be extremely uh, different to everybody and uh, make sure that people know that we are the real deal. And so we are going to meet now our first super Simeon, Simeon the Holy Fool. That was his name. And he lived in Syria, in the north, near the Turkish border, in a town called Edessa. And Simeon wanted to do something really extreme to show how serious his belief was, to stand out against that backdrop of nominalism. So he went the ordinary route, as many did, and became a monk, separating from the mainstream. But he took it to a whole new level. Rather than just reject the kind of cultural Christianity or fashionable faith of the others, he decided to reject everything. Everything, including his own humanity and his own reason. And this story is a little bit like an extreme version of what a lot of people think Christians are like today. Christians hate everything. Haters who reject the world. Haters who reject even human reason. The people who say, music, that's evil. Science, that's evil. Art, that's evil. Literature, that's evil, unless it's Christian. Movies, evil. Casual clothes, evil. Modern food, evil. Reason and scientific progress, evil. Reject it all. Now, sadly, there are one or two folks who do do that and reinforce the reputation of Christians being basically holier-than-thou morons who leave their brains at home so that they can come to church. And this was our first Simeon. He was the king of that whole idea. He was so into rejecting everything that he wanted to reject even his own brain 
But he couldn't take it out, so he decided to become a complete fool in everyone's eyes. He thought, I will separate from those half-hearted Christians by doing something really, really extreme. I'll reject all reason. And the, the reason he thought that that was a good idea was because he thought, well, hang on. If I reject everything in the world, every distraction, every cultural artifact, even if I reject my own kind of thinking and I'm just nothing but a dispassionate shell, I'll be in tune with the mind of God alone. That was his thinking. So you can see how he got there. He wasn't just totally nuts. But that utter rejection of reason kind of meant that he had to become a complete fool. But then he thought, that's brilliant because I don't want anyone to realize I'm the best monk ever because I would get proud and people would congratulate me for being a brilliant monk. So I will become the worst monk ever is what he thought. And famously, he began his ministry after 29 years of solitude in the desert, dehumanizing himself. And he came into Edessa dragging a dead dog that he found on a pile of horse manure outside of town. And as you'd expect, that brought him, this is true, I promise you it's true, that brought him quite a bit of attention in just the way he wanted. This guy's a fool. He's a bad monk, but maybe if he's so out of tune with the world, he's really in tune with God. And so people thought, well, we'll test our new monk out. We'll see if he is the real deal. And so they took a man to him who had some problems with his eyes. He wasn't totally blind, but he had some problems with his eyes. And Simeon thought, well, Jesus anointed a man's eyes with mud. And I can't repeat that. I need to do something foolish. So he decided to anoint the man's eyes with mustard. <laughs> Which, of course, made things worse. So he was a little bit nuts. Speaking of which, on Sundays, he would go into church and he'd blow out all the candles to annoy everyone, and then he'd sit at the back throwing nuts at the women's heads. Just taking them out one by one. At silent fasting days, days of prayer and fasting where everyone had to be quiet, in the morning he would eat beans like a bear so that he could break the silence by breaking wind. That was, that was his trump card against nominalism. So, Simeon the holy fool. Being a Christian isn't about leaving your brain at home. It's not about suspending reason. It's not about rejecting everything in the world. It's not about separating yourself and making yourself so weird that nobody can understand you. There's more to it. We need to think more deeply. So children, Christianity is a very reasonable thing to believe. Ask your, que your, par your parents loads of questions. Annoy them with questions. You should do that. And make sure you get answers from the Bible. Think and think deeply about it. It's really important that you do that. Now we're going to meet our next Simeon, Super Simeon. Simeon the Stylite. Now, he was a kind of forerunner to this holy fool guy. He lived about 100 years before him in the, uh, in the 5th century. And he was another Syrian, this time from the historic city of Aleppo. And I think that's an actual photograph of him right there. Uh, and again, he, he, he didn't like that. It isn't really. Uh, that's, that's one bit that isn't true. Um, he, he didn't like that cultural, convenient Christianity, where it didn't really matter what you believed. And you just wanted a nice job and a peaceful life. So he too wanted to do something radical, something extreme for God, so that he could really stand out against that backdrop of half-hearted Christianity. He tried to ascend the spiritual ladder, almost literally. He tried to reach out to God and get up to God by being super, super religious. Why say one prayer a day when you could pray all day long? And why pray on the ground with all those half-hearted Christians, when you could actually physically, literally get nearer to God. Go higher up. And again, a lot of people today maybe think that's a little bit like what Christianity is about. Do loads of good works and earn your way into heaven. Ascend that spiritual ladder. Reach up to God. Become very religious. Sadly, that's how Simeon the Stylite was brought up to think. And so he decided to reach up to God by living on top of a 50-foot pole. 
That's about as high as the ceiling here. Not quite, but a 50-foot pole. And he lived on that 50-foot pole for 47 years. Seriously. Seriously. God will see all my good works from up here, he thought. There was a little rope ladder that went up the side of the pole so his friends and followers could bring him some food and water. And his biographer wrote that one day, you know, obviously in an act to please the Lord, one day he managed to touch his feet with his head 1,244 times in succession, which is clearly very pleasing to the Lord. (laughs) Another point, the biographer says that his followers would worship the worms as they dropped from his body. Yeah, it's a pretty gruesome story, but it's true. And hopefully it'll tell us and tell you boys and girls that being a Christian isn't about working your way up to God. It's not about reaching up to God and, and, and doing it that way around. That's not Christianity at all. So our horrible histories have told us that it's not a nominal thing. It's not, you're not a Christian because your mum and dad are a Christian. It's not a half-hearted thing. Nor is it about rejecting everything and not being able to think about anything properly. Nor is it about trying to reach up to God. So what is it? What is being a Christian really all about? And our final Simeon, I think, will tell us and help us on this. Simeon of the temple. There's Rembrandt's picture there. And this is a true story from the Bible, from Luke 2, that James read for us. And it says this, There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation, that means the hope, the comforter of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. It says there that Simeon was righteous and devout. So clearly he's not one of these nominal half-hearted guys. He's the real deal. And I can tell you there's not a dead dog or a 50-foot pole in sight with this one. He's a bit more down to earth, a bit more grounded. The next thing it says about Simeon of the temple is that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for someone to come who would bring comfort and peace to to the nation. And that's kind of Bible language way of saying he's waiting for the Messiah, for the Lord's Christ. He longed for the Messiah. So this Simeon has a deep desire for the Messiah. That's important. And we'll think about why in a minute. And Luke goes on to say, the Holy Spirit revealed to him that the Savior would come in his lifetime. This one he's been longing for, that, that, that's directed his thoughts and his passions and his movements all his life, would come in his lifetime. The one that, that the, the nation has been waiting for for hundreds, thousands of years. He would see him with his own eyes. I mean, just imagine the joy, the, 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 the way his heart must have expanded exploded with joy when he heard the news, Simeon, you will see the Lord's Christ before you die. Simeon longed for him. Simeon longed for him and the moment came. Luke 2, 27. He came into the temple in the spirit and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, to, to circumcise him basically, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. I love that moment so much. Simeon takes Jesus into his arms. It's so tender. It's such a warm and dazzlingly moving moment. Simeon holding this one that he's longed for all of his life. You can imagine the joy, can't you, as he cradles that little child. The one who holds us all is held for a moment by Simeon. It's very profound, isn't it? He holds the one who holds all things together, who held his life, gripped his life as he longed for the Messiah to come. Now he holds him in his own arms. The one who holds all things together in as much as, well, not just the center of the Bible, but the center of the universe. And he's come and he's holding him. God made flesh. God become meat. Testable, touchable, real. God with us. He's cradling the mighty God. 
Simeon did not have to go up to meet God. God came down to meet him. God doesn't reject humanity and all of its craziness. God doesn't reject the human mind. He takes into union with himself humanity as he becomes flesh. So Simeon, realizing this, praises God and says in verse 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. This boy is the salvation of God. And look at verse 31. It says, it's done for all people. He's a light for the Gentiles, glory for Israel. That's all people. And all people means you. It means you as well. God came down. God did the extreme thing, didn't he? He went the whole nine yards so that you don't have to. You don't have to climb your way up to meet God. You don't have to earn his favor. He's already come to us. He's already put his feet on this earth. Rather than rejecting humanity, clearing it away, he comes and he takes flesh to himself. The glory of Christmas is precisely that, that God has come to us. God takes humanity to himself, in himself, union. Jesus comes to do life in the raw. He comes to stay. He lived here for 33 years. Simeon, the holy fool, and Simeon, the stylite, did not understand Christmas. That was their problem. They did not understand the incarnation, that God comes to you, that God comes to do life for you, that God comes to take all that is broken and wrong with this world, to take it all on himself as Jesus shoulders it and he's put to death on the cross. All that is wrong, all that is broken, all that we think we want to reject, Jesus was the one who then became rejected. He was the one who was set apart from heaven and from earth. And he took all of that humanity with all its problems, all its death and darkness down into the grave. And so Jesus, when he comes as one of us, he joins humanity like a, like a, like a man falling. He's like a man falling from heaven all the way down, all the way down into death. But then he's rising up again. On the third day, he rose again. And now humanity has a whole new trajectory, a whole new direction of travel, a whole new hope that there is an end to death and disease and decay and poverty and orphans. There is a church family. There is a way now for the world to have real hope. And it's not extreme monkey business, climbing up poles and dragging dead dogs around. It's not religion like that. It is to receive God who came to us, Jesus Christ. Receive the little child. Receive the one who joins the human race. And so my question to you this morning, as we've thought about what a Christian is, a Christian is someone who, who, who takes Jesus to themselves, who holds the one who is given who trusts him as he deals with humanity's problems. That's what a real Christian is. And so my question for you this morning is, will you do that? Will you trust in Christ? Will you turn to this one who came to us to do everything that we couldn't do, who's broken death and has given humanity a whole new trajectory of travel? Will you trust in Christ? Amen.